It's a pleasure to be here. And I appreciate the invitation. Um, I've been um, with uh, ICANN now for about 15 years, which is about the same length of time that LACNIC has been in service. So we have uh, come through the same period. You guys have thrived. I have survived. My time at ICANN is coming to an end, um, and it's time for new leadership. Uh, I will say a few words about both uh, institutions and cooperation on the one hand, and um, uh, some words about technology and uh, the evolution and uh, how to deal with it. And um, I'm more than happy to engage in any kind of dialogue, uh, but for the moment, I'll just uh, tell you a few things that are on my mind. Um, with respect to building institutions, which is really what you all and what we at ICANN have been involved in and our colleagues and partners in other organizations have been about, this is extremely useful, important, productive activity. It is sometimes aggravating, painful, uh, frustrating. Uh, but as we've seen, as you certainly have seen and we have seen, uh, enormous progress uh, if you keep at it and you have goodwill and put energy in. So we have now institutions, both ICANN and LACNIC and, as I say, others, that are much more mature, more stable, have involved uh, people from all over the communities that we serve, uh, developed new leaders, and in addition to what takes place within each of our organizations, most important is that we have a lot of experience now in cooperation across our institutions. And this is quite important because we really are part of one larger ecosystem, and the development of individual organizations within this ecosystem serves both an important purpose of um, aggregating resources and focusing on the problems within a region or within a particular topic, but it also poses some challenges about how to keep the entirety from fracturing into um, uh, independent and non-cooperating components. So the cooperation across our organizations is as important as the success of each of our organizations. For LACNIC, quite obviously this means cooperation with the other regional internet registries, cooperation with the governments of the various countries, uh, cooperation with industry, and of course, as I've just said, cooperation with the other uh, members of the ecosystem. Speaking about ICANN, as I think everybody is, is well aware, and if you're not, then we have not yet spent enough money on the publicity of the transition process, but uh, we're now one year past the uh, uh, magical date in which the uh, contractual relationship between the U.S. government and ICANN came to an end. When ICANN was established in 1998, it was intended that there would be a temporary relationship that would be completed within a couple of years. The year 2000 was mentioned. Well, it took a little longer than that. Um, and in mid-March of 2014, uh, the U.S. government said, yeah, we think the time has finally come. We'll do a quick check with the community to make sure everybody's comfortable. Oh, my goodness. Uh, the quick check took two and a half years, spent millions and millions of dollars, thousands of people involved, uh, many, many phone calls, many, many meetings, uh, volumes of paperwork generated. Uh, but at the end, uh, it all happened. And as I say, we're now one year past that point, and just beginning, I would say, 
to uh, sort of recover from the um, enormous effort and begin to focus on where we're going uh, in the future and how to conduct ourselves. Uh, all of that is to let me say uh, enormous thank you to you and to everybody else in the community who was very helpful, very supportive, fully engaged, and, um, and uh, truly, we would not exist except for your participation. We would not have a purpose, frankly. And so I'm really very pleased and uh, uh, want to convey, uh, in all sincerity, enormous amount of thanks to you. Um, there's probably a lot more to say about institutional uh, cooperation, about internet governance, et cetera, but um, I'm going to turn my attention over to a slightly more technical matter that uh, uh, is also the kind of thing that is very challenging. Um, it was suggested to me I might say a few words about IPv6. Um, I'm just waiting to see if everybody wants to walk out of the room. No, it's fine. Okay. Um, so, as we all know, um, the address space for the internet uh, was set up to use what's called IPv4, 32-bit addresses, uh, 4 billion possible addresses seemed like an enormous, enormous big number. Couldn't possibly imagine that we'd run out. Wrong. We ran out, or we have been using them at a rate that uh, uh, has made it very problematic. So, uh, more than 20 years ago, if you can imagine, uh, there was a recognition that something needed to be done. Several years were spent exploring alternatives, and the result was uh, the decision to uh, promulgate what's now called IPv6. The addresses are 128 bits long, four times as long as an IPv4 address. Uh, for those of you who do the arithmetic, that's not four times as many addresses. That's four billion raised to the fourth power. That's a very big number. That's big enough so that you can probably label all the atoms in the universe if you were so inclined. Okay, well, that problem solved. Uh-oh, a uh, little problem. How do you get people to use it? How do you transition from uh, IPv4 to IPv6? Uh-oh. Uh, we're still struggling with that. The, uh, I have to say, on behalf of uh, my colleagues who did the design work and the planning, that we didn't get it right, that uh, the transition has not gone simply or smoothly. Um, people did not sort of uh, say, oh, this is great, let me get an IPv6 address as quickly as possible. Everybody who has an IPv4 address will get an IPv6 address, and then we can just um, silently transition over. Has not happened at all. What did happen is that people said, well, I've got an IPv4 address, so I'm perfectly happy. And uh, other people came along and said, everybody's using IPv4, I want to use IPv4 as well. And so the uh, exhaustion problem got worse. And meanwhile, there was a very slow rate of adoption on IPv6. We're now in a very awkward position because there's no way to go back and say scrap it all. The pressures that were there originally that forced us to think about the next generation of addressing uh, are not only have remained, but have been exacerbated. You've been hearing this morning about Internet of Things. Uh, that will cause an enormous explosion of the number of devices, and hence the number of addresses. Um, many, many reasons why we have to move forward with IPv6. And at the same time, the um, forces that are um, uh, not, I won't say resisting, but that are keeping IPv4 in place continue to be in place, and we now see uh, the rise of secondary markets in IPv4 space with a um, considerable set of issues and problems and challenges. How much are they worth? Who owns them? What are the rules? Uh, et cetera. And uh, no one's exactly sure whether the price of these is going to go up or whether they're all of a sudden going to become obsolete and go down. Um, 
let me let me steer around that particular set of issues and simply talk about the way forward as best I can see it. Um, it is evident uh, that, as I've said, and as, as you can easily observe, that we're not going to see a magical day in which IPv4 is turned off in all of the networks. Uh, IPv4 is going to continue for some very long period of time. <coughs> me. And so we're not talking about a transition in the usual sense that one would think of that. We're really talking about uh, a kind of coexistence between IPv4 and IPv6. That coexistence is underway and will continue for quite a long time. I don't know exactly how long, um, but uh, we may be able to discuss it with our children, and uh, they may be asking us questions, well, when do you think it will really happen? Um, maybe we'll be luckier and they won't know what IPv4 is, but it's possible that they will. Um, been a lot of talk about, well, how can we speed this up? What are the incentives? What are the uh, uh, impediments? Um, I want to suggest a, um, a slightly more relaxed but uh, sort of more penetrating way to look at the issue. Uh, and I'm going to do it in uh, two different ways. First of all, uh, with respect to time, uh, I think it's helpful to divide the time up into five uh, large periods, uh, epochs in the um, archaeological or uh, sense. Uh, phase one, pure IPv4 networks. Phase five is the exact complement of that, pure IPv6 networks. Good news, we passed through phase one. Phase two is um, IPv4 is dominant, but IPv6 is gained traction and is on the rise. I think we are, in fact, in phase two. And phase four in my five-part model is the complement of that. IPv6 is dominant and IPv4 is on the decline, is waning. And phase three in the middle of all of this is when you can say, gee, it's evident that IPv6 has become active enough so that it's not the minority uh, or very small fraction of the, of the um, traffic. Um, but it's still the case that IPv4 is still very active, and so it's a sort of frothy middle time. I have to say, I don't think we've reached that yet. Um, you can have some long arguments as to when we'll get there, but I think it's, it's reasonable to say we're somewhere in the phase two period, and uh, that's a helpful mental model. At least I find it helpful. The other dimension is to look uh, below the level that I've been talking about and say, well, when we talk about IPv6, what are we actually talking about? Um, because there's several different aspects to this. Uh, quite obviously, the uh, wide area transport, the uh, intercontinental, the uh, intracontinental, the, uh, the intercity uh, transport, you can look and say, is IPv6 available? Is it being used? Uh, you can also ask, if I call up my service provider, can I get IPv6 service? That is something that I think is helpful to look at, and one of the uh, takeaways that, uh, from this talk that you might, um, might want is it might be helpful to measure not only how much traffic there is, but how much connectivity there is, how much availability. Is it possible, as I said, for a customer to say, I want an IPv6 transport out of my enterprise, out of my home, out of my university, to reach other people? And also, whether or not that transport will be pure IPv6 or whether it will get trans uh, translated into IPv4 on the way and then translated back out. I don't know what the facts are. Uh, I don't track this super closely, but I have the sense that we are uh, in pretty good shape with respect to a lot of IPv6 transport, but still not the case that you can count on IPv6 availability everywhere. Still not the case that you can count on uh, IPv6 end-to-end -end from your front door to the front door of where you're going. So that's one element, availability of IPv6 transport. 
that's not the only uh, uh, dimension in this model that is important. Here's a couple more. Uh, let's say that IPv6 service is available end-to-end -end anywhere you want. Um, would that induce you or enable you to use it? Well, uh, the next thing that I suspect most people want is, can I reach the services that I want to reach? Can I reach the DNS service that I want? Can I uh, reach Amazon? Can I reach eBay? Can I reach the bank? Can I reach the government? Uh, all of the public-facing services, whether we're talking about commerce, talking about education, whether we're talking about government, <coughs> news, whatever, um, you will be looking for to see if they are accessible over IPv6. So in the coexistence slash transition process, that one of the uh, leading edges, one of the things that has to happen before everything else is whether or not all of the services that you're looking for are available over IPv6. I have not yet seen, although uh, except anecdotally, any comprehensive measurement of availability of services that you depend upon. So in the, um, what do I have to do first before I can do second, I would say the availability of services is one of the things that has to be sort of earlier rather than later. It's not bad. There are a lot of services available over IPv6, but I have not yet seen a push for that to be um, the um, uh, sort of taken for, get for granted as the thing to do, where if a uh, government or a office or if a uh, commercial firm or um, education or news or whatever is making a service available and they're not providing it over IPv6, uh, are we complaining about that? Are we saying, wait, that's not right. You're, you're not making it accessible to the people uh, that need to get it. The third part of this picture is uh, the hardware and other products, software products that we need. Now, the good news in that is that for quite some time, typical um, personal computers from Microsoft uh, operating system or um, Apple's uh, Macs and, and the um, smartphones have been IPv6 enabled and, uh, and so they're, in principle, at least good to go. Um, there's some subtlety, however. One can ask, well, what about the routers? What about the network management devices? What about the uh, network security devices? Um, several years ago, uh, the Security Stability Advisory Committee in ICANN, um, which I chaired for, for a while, uh, we did a study and we said, suppose a network administrator or a um, secure network security uh, manager said, I want my group or my institution or my enterprise to switch over internally to IPv6. Are the products that help me manage my network available to run in IPv6 as they do in IPv4? So we went and looked at products out in the marketplace and we did a survey and, the, and this is now several years ago so the data is quite stale but it was uh, but, but nonetheless the the report is still available um, and we discovered that uh, the IPv6 enabled products were very uh, the market was thin not all of them were available and the same products even operating in IPv6 mode instead of IPv4 mode were less capable in terms of their features and their ability to manage the network not a good picture I suspect if we looked at the data again that the situation would be much better but I don't know for sure where we are and that would be another way of measuring and characterizing where we are along the path toward IPv6 uh, adoption so all of these um, address the question for the managers or individuals even who are, going, who, are po who are looking at the possibility of can I live in an IPv6 world? And if the answers are positive there, then we've at least removed some of the impediments. We may not have uh, incentivized financially, we may not have tamped down on the IPv4 pressure, but at least we have cleared the way for IPv6, and I think that that's uh, important. Yeah, let me say a word about uh, IPv4 and IPv6. Um, um, one of the uh, great 
uh, thrills and pleasures of uh, the kind of role that I've had is I get to travel around quite a bit and meet people. And some uh, very wonderful things happen, but also some odd things happen, some just peculiar things. Um, uh, I, of course, am speaking English, uh, or if you prefer American English. Um, our British folks have some complaints about that. Um, but I've discovered that um, uh, the difference between American English and British English is not nearly as great as the difference between uh, American English and the English spoken in India. How can that be? Uh, the British were there for a long time, and uh, English is the common language within India. But there are some interesting twists. If you get on an airplane, in, uh, in that part of the world, you might be offered a meal, and the meal will be vegetarian or non-vegetarian. Might be lamb, might be fish, might be chicken. It'll just be labeled non-vegetarian. I had a conversation with a group, I'll keep it short, but the, uh, I was uh, uh, trying to uh, engage in some light conversation, a little bit of teasing with a young woman about a group that she came out of uh, which I knew full well was a mixed group of men and women, but in the context, she was only describing herself and another woman. So I said, kind of jokingly, were there only women in the group? She said, oh no, there were non-women too. My head went spinning, non-women, what a great idea. Um, but in that spirit, let me suggest that we take a page from that and adopt the posture that there are only two kinds of addresses on the internet, IPv6 addresses and non-IPv6 addresses. Adopt that and we can help shift the mindset of um, what's a proper and appropriate and what's to be expected. So with that, um, I don't know how much time I've used up, but uh, I think we're get closer to back on schedule. I'd be happy to engage in questions and answers either here or separately with you. Um, again, let me thank you uh, for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, we're gonna have a party, I presume, pretty soon. I'm looking forward to that. And again, let me thank you uh, very much from the bottom of my heart for all of the support and engagement that you've had in our processes, and we hope that uh, we've been supportive of you. You guys have done enormous work over the 15-year period, uh, and I applaud you. Okay. Thank you, you very much. You take questions? Steve, thank yeah. you very much. If someone has some question or comment to make for Steve, you can do it. Si, sa, si alguien tiene algún comentario o alguna pregunta para Steve, se puede acercar a los micrófonos y hacerla, y también lo puede hacer en, en español, que Steve tiene el traductor. Gracias. Hi Steve, my name is Carlos, I work for Langnick. Voy a hacer mi pregunta en español, I will ask in Spanish. Uh, I can do una de sus primeras reuniones aquí en 2001, creo que en esta misma sala. Y ahora estamos aquí 15 años después. Eh, me gustaría que nos digas en, en pocas palabras cómo has visto la evolución de la comunidad de LACNIC en este periodo. Bueno, well, thank you for the question. Um, I, I was not here in 2001, and um, it was uh, several years before I made my first trip to Montevideo, and I was uh, just uh, very, very surprised and pleased. This is a wonderful place. I grew up in uh, Southern California, in the Los Angeles area, and uh, Los Angeles, if you've seen it in the movies or had the privilege to be there, is uh, right on the ocean. There are palm trees, eucalyptus trees. Uh, it's a city that was built with the automobile um, I get off the plane, I get picked up here. Uh, next thing I know, I'm driving along on a big wide street, fast cars, palm trees, eucalyptus trees, pretty women, the beach, I'm home. Um, oh, you wanted me to talk about Lacnic? No, I'm just talking about Montevideo. Um, uh, 
the house that the the house of the internet uh i was just really um uh, thrilled and uh, uh pleasantly surprised to see what a jewel it is just a, 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 a sort of a perfect structure in terms of focus in terms of embracing everybody and sending a message as well as being a functional place to work and the community of course has developed and embraces the entire region um, i don't know what specifically you want me to comment on but in my view lacnic is uh, a a success or as i've had to learn from sitting in endless um, uh, bureaucratic and uh, diplomatic meetings. There are only two kinds of meetings, successes and big successes. Uh, LACNIC is a big success. Hola, mi nombre es Julia, estoy del equipo de moderadores remotos. Desde Miami, Shane Fuller nos pregunta. El señor Crocker nos dice de colaboración entre regiones, pero vemos también regiones amenazadas como lo que pasó con Punto Cat de Cataluña, que su registro fue invalidado por la policía. ¿Qué hacer contra esta violencia? ¿Aican tendrá una respuesta? <laughs> Thank you for the question. Uh, we too have seen the news. Uh, we're talking about an event that I think took place yesterday, uh, in which the Spanish government um, took an action against the dot .cat uh, registry, and um, we're still waiting to see exactly what that means and so forth. Um, uh, we're certainly not in a position to make any statement about um, where this is going or what's going to happen, but it is quite obviously important. Um, in general, ICANN wants not to be involved in the politics and wants not to be involved in content um, uh, management or uh, uh, determination of what's appropriate. We do want uh, very stable, reliable uh, operations. Uh, we do want this to be part of the infrastructure that people depend upon. Quite obviously, those things come into contact with each other, and different people have different views about what the right thing is. Um, I, I think the appropriate thing for me to say is that we are already watching this very closely, and we will undoubtedly uh, find that all of the plans that we've made and all of the uh, lines that we've tried to draw are going to be challenged, and we're going to have to think through those. Um, and I, um, I, I think just sort of stay tuned, watch this channel. Thank you. Thanks, Steve, and thank you for coming to our LACNIC meetings. Uh, this is Oscar Robles from LACNIC. I'm going to uh, make the question in Spanish. Um, como todos sabemos, LACNIC fue construida sobre algunos principios técnicos fundamentales que le han dado esa, ese crecimiento y esa eh, pervasividad que todos conocemos. ¿Cuál, en tu opinión, cuál consideras que es el que se ha perdido más y qué podríamos hacer en esta comunidad, desde la comunidad técnica, eh, para recuperar eh, lo más de ese principio fundamental que ha hecho al Internet tan robusto. Gracias. Well, wait a minute, don't go away. Um, the form of your question uh, contains an assumption that something's been lost. And uh, maybe I'm just a little slow on the uptake today, but uh, let me ask you to be uh, more forthcoming and say what it is that um, uh, you're trying to draw our attention to, and then I'll be happy to try to respond. Well, um, someone may think that the internet is not as open as it used to be uh, in the 80s, uh, 90s, I don't know. Uh, someone may think that it is not as interoperable as it used to be, um, uh, but obviously it depends on uh, what kind of uh, data and, and information you consider. Uh, uh, I'm assuming that, yes, that there's a little um, uh, lost in some of the principles, but I'm not sure if uh, you share that uh, uh, presumption or that, that idea. And if, it, if that is the case, uh, what could we do to, to recover that, part, that, uh, uh, that loss in, in that specific principle? Yeah, thank you. Now I, now I understand. Um, 
I'm going to say something that will not be completely satisfying, but I think is, is probably uh, uh, the right thing for all of us. Um, the internet grew from relatively small beginnings to and got bigger and bigger and embedded in all of our lives. Uh, it's now part of everything we do, and because of that, everything we do uh, includes all of the sensitive things, politics, religion, uh, commerce, uh, uh, entertainment, every aspect of our life, our health. Um, and the issues that arise in those arenas are being brought into the internet space. It's not an internet problem per se, it's a society problem. It's the kinds of issues that drive our political life, our economic life. Um, and um, the fact that all of those tensions, controversies, activities are taking place now in the space of the internet is a reflection of what has existed and what will continue to exist. It's not, as I say, an internet problem per se, and it's not for us as, I'll call us internet technicians, to believe that we have the handle on solving those. Um, so the question, what can we do, that you asked, uh, which is a very reasonable question, I would say is engage in those dialogues in the appropriate venues. Um, it is not, I hope, at the place where we manage the infrastructure and provide a reliable operation for everybody for those discussions to take place. Those discussions should take place in the other organizations, in the other venues, and if they don't exist, we should create them. But that is part of the integration of the internet in our entire life. But it is not, as I say, a problem that uh, ICANN is the place to solve, LACNIC is the place to solve. Maybe if LACNIC wants to take it on, but I, I would uh, uh, suggest that you may want to think twice about how much you want to take on within this infrastructure. Thank you. Uh, Jordi Palet, hi Steve. I am going to speak in Spanish. Mm -hmm. um, no, no quiero hacer un discurso político, pero me parece importante aclarar un poco la pregunta que, que se hizo eh, hace un momento. Eh, no me gusta mucho la política. Yo soy nacido en Barcelona, Cataluña. Vivo en Madrid desde pequeño. No me considero nacionalista ni patriota siquiera. Soy ciudadano del mundo. Trabajo en todo el mundo. Eh, y yo creo que todo el mundo va a entender lo que voy a explicar, porque... Creo que es fundamental que no haya desinformación en ningún tema y eso aplica también aquí a la comunidad, pero a cualquier otro aspecto. Eh, lo que el, los jueces están haciendo en España es impedir un referéndum que nuestra Constitución dice que es ilegal. Es como si un grupo de esta comunidad intentase cambiar las políticas porque son mayoría en lugar de haber consenso. Es decir, no se puede hacer un referéndum, el Tribunal Constitucional ha dicho que no se puede hacer y el gobierno español está intentando evitar suspender la autonomía y en lugar de eso los jueces están tomando todas las acciones necesarias para que ese referéndum no se celebre y como el gobierno catalán insiste cada vez que le cierran la página web del referéndum en abrir otra y otra y otra y tienen el dominio.cat, pues una forma de evitar que tengan que cerrar una a una las páginas es tomar el control. Eh, creo que todo el mundo lo puede entender eso. Eh, siento hacer un discurso político, no me gusta la política, pero creo que es importante aclararlo. Y sobre todo el ejemplo, como digo, ocurriría aquí lo mismo si un grupo de la comunidad quisiera cambiar la forma de funcionamiento. ¿no? Tiene que ser entre todos, no unos pocos. Gracias. Thank you very much. Um, so... I understand and appreciate the point that you're making, that this is a, 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 a political issue with respect to what the rules of engagement are of different parts of the community, the Catalonians, the Spanish government, and so forth. Um, the interesting step is the translation of that into a very specific piece of action um, to attempt to... Um, shut down .cat as a registry or the registrations. I don't know exactly what the specifics are yet, but, but to uh, intercede there. Um, we'll see how that plays out, but let me draw another analogy. 
uh, in the U.S. and in some other uh, countries, we, um, several years ago, there was uh, legislative attempts to use the domain name system as a way of shutting down access to uh, sites that were not accessible physically within the U.S. that contained uh, material that infringed on copyrights that were held within the U.S. So the movie companies and uh, record companies and uh, other publishers were unhappy that um, pirated copies of material were available and that people could reach offshore to get that. And there was proposed legislation that would say, well, if we can't shut them down directly, we will ask, no, ask is the wrong word, we will tell the ISPs that when queries for the domain name reference to them, for the IP address to them, are made through them, that they have to not give the correct response, either give no response or give a, folk, a, a, a different response of some sort. And there was a huge debate about that. And just to be fully uh, forthcoming, I participated along with four other colleagues on writing a technical white paper explaining why this was a, a bad idea. Uh, there are multiple reasons why it's a bad idea, but uh, probably the one that is easiest to understand is it won't work. Uh, it's just a, um, uh, uh, a, futile, uh, a futile idea. People will find their way around it, and they will get a lot of help finding their way around it, and the result will be uh, 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 bad for everybody. Raise costs, may it be messy, uh, and um, several other secondary effects, and as I say, not accomplish the goal. Uh, I'm not sure everybody agrees with that, and it's awfully appealing, sort of like a bright, shiny object is a term that we use a lot, in which you say, ah, we could shut down the access method for getting there. That does not get to the core of the issue. And so, you know, it's understandable that there be attempts like that, um, and I don't want to comment on the political aspects of whether or not the um, political speech that's involved is appropriate or within the rules, but I can comment that as a practical matter, um, it's not, it has not been very successful um, as, a, uh, as, an, as a super effective way of shutting down that kind of speech, and it undermines the uh, robustness, reliability, and um, credibility that we need in our infrastructure. And so from that point of view, uh, it has a deleterious negative effect. Hi, Steve. Thanks for coming down here. I know how much you had to go through to get here because I came from California myself. <laughs> Long trip. But um, my name is Joe Alanya. I'm with Affilius uh, Domain Name Registry. Um, I'm just curious, you know, just like uh, the need for IPv6 had come along because um, of changes in the world and, you know, the, the growth of the Internet. And just like uh, we went from using numbers in the early days, you know, back when you started, to domain names. What do you see as, uh, or do you see, you're a lot more exposed to the leading edge of the industry. What do you see as, is there anything that you see that will become uh, more used than domain names? in the, uh, will, will there be another, you know, I mean, I'm really bullish on them, but I'm curious because, you know, you're exposed to a lot of technology. Do you see anything that would be the next step beyond domain names? Uh, I'm not the one who's going to be able to give a, a really useful answer to that. Um, we continue to be surprised and thrilled by the inventions, and they typically come from uh, people who are, uh, a little bit younger than I am. No, that's wrong. By people who are a lot younger than I am. Um, what I do think is that um, the internet is, is, is this brand new thing that has been completely disruptive and has changed life. Well, that was true. Now the internet is old. And like a lot of old technologies, it does not really go away very rapidly. So what I think is likely to be is that we're going to be living with domain names for a very, very long time. Will there be other things that uh, become uh, the dominant way in which you identify things? Uh, well, we already have Skype and Facebook handles and uh, Twitter handles and so forth. 
Um, and then we have uh, now uh, forthcoming pretty rapid changes in biometrics and the ability to use speech and so forth. So I can't quite tell where all of this is going to go, but at least for a while, um, I'm not one that's going to tell you that the domain name system is just about to disappear. Uh, it'll probably be around even longer than IPv4. Oh, sorry, non-IPv6 addresses. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. A real pleasure. Um, quizá muchos de ustedes eh, conocen a Steve Crocker por sus aportaciones a las definiciones de los protocolos, a la definición de los RFCs. Algunos de ustedes con una historia más reciente, eh, cercana a ICANN, lo conocen por su eh, aportación y participación en ICANN. Pero eh, para la comunidad de LACNIC, una de las principales aportaciones y por la cual eh, queremos darle eh, un eh, reconocimiento es eh, por el esfuerzo y por haber completado la transición de Yana. Eh, parece algo, se dice fácil, pero eh, tomó eh, eh, trabajo de muchas eh, personas en la comunidad, pero no es ese trabajo eh, realmente el que queremos reconocer aquí, sino la, la visión y la capacidad de convencer al gobierno de Estados Unidos y a todas las autoridades involucradas en ese proceso de aprovechar esa ventana de tiempo que eh, eh, fue eh, única, porque dadas las condiciones actuales, creo que no habría sido posible tener esa, esa transición y, y no sabemos qué podría haber pasado. Finalmente, esa transición se dio y mucho me parece que debemos agradecerle a Steve, que entre otras personas, porque obviamente no, 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 no hay eh, esfuerzos únicos acá, pero me parece que Steve fue protagonista y eh, clave en ese proceso de la transición de Yana, por lo cual me, me gustaría que me acompañaran a darle un fuerte aplauso y reconocimiento de nuestra comunidad por ese, por ese esfuerzo. <risa>